Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Braden Knudsen. I'll be your host for this webinar today. We would like to thank everybody for joining us. As we get started here, we'd like to invite you to participate in the polls that we have on the screen as we go through our announcements and our introduction here. Um, so our next webinar after today will be next Friday, January 26th at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And that is titled Family Tree Cleanup Case Study 1 by Catherine Grant. Um, so that'll be another good one and always super helpful. So we invite you back for that one. Um, and also just some um, by way of other announcements. We've had lots of feedback about people not being able to watch our YouTube videos in their um, local family history center or their ward building because YouTube gets blocked. And I know that's not everywhere, but some places do. So we've tried to provide this um, extra viewing platform where you can go to, and I'll just kind of show you right now. Um, if you go to our website, right here on the main home page, we've got this little advertisement space here that kind of talks about it a little bit just to kind of catch everyone's eye. Um, so if you click on the link here, it takes you to this page. We're still kind of testing it, so there's not a ton of videos at the moment. Um, but probably the best place is to come down here and you can click on you can click on any one of these links and they'll take you to a list of videos. Um, and these videos should be able to be viewed in your local family history center or your ward building. If you have a video that is not on those lists, please send me an email and I will get it uploaded to that so we can make that available to you. Like I said, this is new and we don't have a ton of content on here yet. We're still working on transition. And if you wouldn't mind filling out this survey here, if you do get a chance to use this page, let us know what you liked, what we can do to improve, and that's always much appreciated. Um, so that's something new and we hope it's it's really helpful as we as we get moving forward. And also, if you ever have any questions or comments or suggestions, please send us an email. Our email address is down here at the bottom of the announcements pod. It's FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And that's always um, very helpful to receive feedback. So today we'll be pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation titled Understanding the International Genealogical Index. After years on the sidelines, Catherine started doing family history and discovered a new passion. Her specialty is mentoring new family historians and helping them find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Catherine works for the LDS Church as a technical writer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and homemade guacamole. Um, we'd love to see all the people participating. It looks great. And as we turn the time over to Catherine, um, just remind you that we have our comments and questions box on the right-hand side. And any questions that are submitted, we'll make sure get answered by the end of the presentation. And Catherine, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. That sounds great. Thank you, Braden, so much. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure appreciate you taking time to, to uh, either listen to this webinar or if you're watching later on, appreciate you watching. So today we are going to be talking about the International Genealogical Index, or the IGI. And you might have heard people mention this, or you might have even seen a source in Family Tree that mentioned the IGI and maybe wondered what it was and, and why it was important. So today we hope to answer some of those questions in our webinar. And let's look at what we're going to be covering today. If I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So first of all, we're going to talk about what exactly the IGI is. Next, we'll talk about the data in the IGI and um, where the records came from and what the coverage is and so forth. And then finally, we'll give two specific examples of how the IGI can help you in your research. So first of all, what is the IGI? 
the IGI, essentially, this is a very basic definition. It's a digital collection of about 900 million entries with names of deceased individuals. Having said that, I need to let you know that right before this webinar, I got a message from somebody in Family Tree, or excuse me, in Family Search, that this number was not correct. And I actually got it out of the wiki. And so we'll proceed because right now that's the only information I have, but very likely I'll need to come back and correct this. Either we'll re-record the webinar at some future time, or I will post a note on the comments of the YouTube video so that people know what the correct numbers are. But for now, this is these are the numbers we have, but they're probably not correct. So, But it's a huge number. It's a, a large number of names, whatever it turns out to be. So the names came from two sources, the names that are currently in the IGI. About half of them, a little over half, were contributed by the community. And when they say community, basically those were people who sent in names to the LDS Church and they were names of their family. So for instance, the old four generation program and three generation program, those names ended up in the IGI. But then also, a, a, a large set of names, just under half, were what they were calling community indexed. Some of you might remember the old extraction program, which was basically the old version of the indexing program, where volunteers would look at parish registers and other records and so forth, and basically index them. And then those names were provided to the temple for patrons, and they were also eventually added to this IGI um, set of records. If you're like me, a picture is worth a thousand words and it helps to visualize something. So I wanted to show you an example of a community contributed record. Many of you may recognize this as an old family group record, family group sheet, that was used in the days before the internet. So people would fill these out and send these sheets, actually, these paper sheets, into the LDS Church. They had uh, volunteers or employees who would uh, digitize those and add those to the database. So this is kind of typical, uh, I say that with a little hesitation, it, it's typical in a very broad sense of the type of records that would have been sent into the church by the community. And when I say in a broad sense, uh, some of them were had less information, some of them had more, some were typewritten, some were handwritten. The quality was basically all over the board because they were being submitted by uh, all kinds of members from all over the place. And so this is just kind of a representative example of the type of information that was contributed by the community. As far as the community indexed example, this is an example of a parish register. So this is what volunteers would have been extracting or indexing, and then those names were also put in the IGI. So what was the original purpose of the IGI? Why did the church even start it? Well, there were basically three, three solid reasons for it. The first one was that before the IGI, and, and you know, going back without computers, records were kept all over the place. So individual temples would keep their individual records. There were some records held at church headquarters. And as the church grew and as the genealogical efforts increased, the church realized that they absolutely had to gather this data in one place. So the IGI was part of that effort to put everything into, into one place. Another very important purpose was to allow members to verify whether or not temple work had been done. Duplication has been a problem since the early days of the church, as you can imagine, because multiple people are related to the same ancestors. And especially before the days of computers and even before the days of telephones and so forth, um, it was difficult for people to coordinate and reduce duplication. So the IGI, that was a big step forward for the church to put everything in one place so that members could see if temple work had already been done so they could avoid doing it again when it wasn't necessary. And then finally, the hope of the um, people who put the IGI together was that it would provide information for additional research. So you might find a clue in there that would lead you to 
find other records about your ancestors. So those were the original purposes of the IGI. Let's contrast that now with the current purpose. And there's, I, I debated whether to put this uh, at this point in the presentation or later, because in a way it's kind of um, iterative as far as uh, the purpose impacting the data and vice versa. But the current purpose, and you'll see what I mean when we get into the data, but let's summarize the current purpose as being a research aid. And then also that it's very helpful for providing clues about the origin of family tree records. So how do you get to the IGI? There's a couple of ways, and let's look at, at those. I think the simplest way probably is to click search in the family search menu, and then go to find a collection. When you click search, you'll get the, this historical record screen. Then over here in the right-hand corner, there's a, a input field where you can start typing the name of any collection. So if you type international genealogical or, or part of it, you notice that then the full name appears below. So you can click that. And then when you do, you get taken to the IGI search screen where you can search directly. Now, if you're an a uh, URL person, which I tend to be, you can also go directly to this URL. So familysearch.org slash search slash collection slash IGI. And that, and also once that you've typed that in your browser, the browser will most likely remember it. So in the future, you probably just have to type IGI and it'll pop up as a, um, as an option. Uh, when I say type IGI, I mean in the address bar of your browser and then the full URL will most likely pop up as an option and you can just click it to go straight to the IGI. There's another way that for me is a little bit more complicated, but if you want to search the entire genealogy site and not just the IGI, this would be the way to do that. So you start again by clicking search and then you click genealogies and when you do you get this genealogy search screen now it searches everything in genealogies the guild of one name studies the community trees the oral genealogies and so forth and the igi but if you just want to search the igi from this screen you actually scroll down a little bit and there is a drop down that lets you select which specific collection in genealogies you want to search. So if you wanted to just search the IGI from that main genealogy screen, you pick IGI here and then click search. And see, you can probably see why that to me is a little bit more complicated. You have to fiddle with the drop down, but it's a great advantage if you're wanting to search the whole genealogies site and not just the IGI. Okay, so let's move on to understanding the data in the IGI. Let's talk first about the key milestones in the way that the data kind of evolved over time. Kind of it's helpful to give us context about where the data, how the data started and kind of how it ended up. So the first big deal for the church was that in 1969, they purchased a computer system. And the name of this system internally to the church was Giant. So it's not just saying that the computer system was big, although I'm sure it was, but they actually named it Giant. And they used that computer system as a way to hold all the genealogical data that had been collected so far by the church. So it held temple records, it held extracted records, and it also held member submitted records. So that started in 1969. In 1973, the church published that information in a collection which they called the Computer File Index, if you may have heard of that before, um, abbreviated as CFI, and this was published on microfiche. It had about 20 million entries, and about 80% of those were extracted records. 
Let's move on to 1981 when the CFI was renamed the International Genealogical Index. So the same data, the same emphasis, but a, a more applicable name, I think, and a more um, interesting name, frankly. Computer File Index doesn't tell you much about what it is, but the, the record truly is an international genealogical index to many, many names. And as we see at this point in time in 1981, it had quadrupled in size to about 81 million entries. Fast forward to 1988, we're moving ahead with technology and the IGI is published on CD-ROM. The number of entries continues to grow, so it's 147 there, 147 million. 1993, the CD-ROM version is updated and then contains over 200 million entries from about 90 countries. Again, the large percent of the percentage of those are extracted records. 1999, IGI is released on FamilySearch.org, and some of you might even remember using the IGI on FamilySearch.org. I remember how excited we were about that because you just used it on the internet. You didn't have to put a CD-ROM in your CD drive or anything. It was just so awesome to have it online, and it consisted of about 285 million entries. And then finally, in 2011 to 2012, Family Tree was released. And of course, as, as I'm sure most of you know, Family Tree is now the central repository of the church for records that have had temple work done. And so the ordinance, because of that, ordinance information no longer shows in the IGI because it's in Family Tree. But the IGI, as we mentioned a little earlier, is available in the genealogies section of FamilySearch.org. So those are the key milestones in the way that the data grew from the very beginning to the point where it is now. Let's look at countries that are represented in the IGI. The majority of the records came from Great Britain, and probably, I'm just surmising here, I'm not speaking officially by any means, but I'm guessing that this is because so many of the early converts were from Great Britain, from England and the other countries of the UK. So I'm guessing that that's why many people focused on that, because that's where their ancestors were from. But other countries are represented in the IGI, and I won't read through these, but you can see a list of these countries that do have entries in the IGI. The, as soon as the IGI, or excuse me, as soon as Family Tree was released, the IGI froze. It stopped accepting any additional information. So names cannot be added any longer to the IGI. Basically, it's a snapshot in time. What that also means is that information cannot be edited. So if you find a mistake in the IGI or you find duplicates in the IGI, there's not any way to correct it. We just have to accept the fact that it is what it is and um, mistakes and all. And even with the mistakes and the duplication, it still is a very valuable resource. So what about the names in the IGI? Let's talk a little bit about that. Contrary to popular opinion or popular belief, the names in the IGI were not verified by the church or by family search. So when you go to the IGI, you need to be careful and do your own verification because those names are just as they were submitted by the members or as they were extracted. So accuracy and completeness vary widely and duplication is quite extensive and you just have to search the IGI for a little while to see that that's the case. So that being said, how can the IGI help you? I want to provide two specific examples, one for, of an extracted record and one of a community contributed record. So the IGI basically, if I were to sum up 
the reason that I think that it's most helpful to us in doing our family history, especially for working in family tree, is that it provides clues about the origin of certain family tree records because that information from the IGI was put in family tree. So let's take a look at these two examples. Oh, um, and let me back up just a little bit. I wanted to cover why it's helpful to understand where a family tree record came from. There's about four reasons. One is that it can help you assess the reliability of the information. It can also show you where errors came from, which is very helpful because sometimes don't you look at a family tree record and you can tell that something's wrong with it, but you don't quite know where the problem started. Is it from a bad merge? Is it from somebody's um, genealogical record? Is it a typo? You, you know, you, it's just hard sometimes to figure out where the error came from. If you can trace that error back to the IGI, then that gives you some important information about where that error came from and, and what you need to do about it. It can also lead to additional information about the person and their family, and we'll give an example of that with the extracted record. And then also, it makes it easier to make good decisions about data and about temple work simply for the fact that you understand it. So let's look at what it means to you as a family historian if a family tree person was created from an extracted record. And I'll apologize in advance that this slide is a little bit text heavy, but I kept it that way on purpose anyway, even knowing the disadvantage, because I think the information is so valuable. And when you watch the webinar that's recorded, you can actually pause on this screen if you need to. So, if a family tree person was created from an extracted record, the reliability is fairly high because they came, that information came straight from a primary source, a, a baptism record, an infant baptism record, or a marriage record that was written down by the government or written down by a church. So, and also on the old extraction program, they were so careful with the way records were extracted. If any of you did that, you remember that everything was extracted twice and then a, a kind of like an arbitrator compared the two records and tried to reduce any errors as much as possible, make sure that the final record was correct. So family tree people from extracted records tend to be very, very accurate. Also, the fact that there was extracted record indicates that there's very likely an image of the extracted record in historical records, family search historical records, or if not, it's very likely that the image is someplace else, like Ancestry or Find My Past, because it's probably on microfilm. In order for it to be extracted, it was probably originally on microfilm. I would say maybe, I don't know, 98, 99% of the time. Now, some of you might be saying, well, that's all fine and good, but now we can't get microfilms in our family history centers anymore. But the microfilms are all still being held at the Family History Library in Salt Lake. And so if you um, need a microfilm that you can't get access to online yet, at least it is available in Salt Lake. And I realize, of course, that not everybody lives in Salt Lake or has easy access to the Family History Library. If you don't, there are some groups online, both on Facebook and Yammer, that are kind of random acts of genealogical kindness where volunteers will do lookups for you for free. So if you can't get to Salt Lake but you need someone to look at these microfilms, try asking somebody on one of those groups. Another wonderful thing about knowing that an extracted record probably has an image is that the original source image probably has more information than the indexed or extracted record. Something I've found very helpful, for instance, is a father's occupation because sometimes it can tell me whether I've really got the right person, especially if the name is very common. It may have an address for the person. It may show witnesses who are also family members. So finding that original record, the original image, can be very helpful.
Also, if a person was created from an extracted record, there's a very good chance that other family members were extracted from the same parish register or same vital records and put in family tree. More than once I found that to be the case where I'll find one person that was extracted and then I find maybe five or eight or ten of their siblings that were also extracted in the same time period. And then finally, if you find a record in Family Tree that was created from an extracted record, you can be pretty confident that at least some and very likely all of the temple work was done. It may not show on the extracted record necessarily due to you know, bad merges or duplications, that kind of thing. So if you find an extracted record that that, that appears to need temple work, you probably want to search for duplicates on that because the duplicate probably has the temple work on it. So here is an example of a, an indication that shows up in the sources section of a family tree person and it indicates that this record was created from an extracted IGI record. Now there's an important caveat here. This doesn't happen often, this problem that I'm going to mention, but I, but I have seen it. And that is that if you merge two IGI records together, then this notice is going to show up twice. Or if you show up and if you merge a non-IGI record with an IGI record, this notice will show up on the merged record, but it doesn't necessarily apply to the information on the non-IGI record, if that makes sense. So this notice may show up, in other words, on a family tree record that isn't just a direct record from the IGI. So you have to use a little caution there and you can tell if merges have been done by going into the show all changes, uh, by clicking the show all changes link on the right side of the person page. I hope that's clear and if it's not, please put a question in the chat box and we'll answer questions. So I'll, I'll try and clarify it better at the end of the webinar. So that's an example of uh, an extracted record. Let's talk now about, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to say though. Let me go back for a minute. If you want to see the indexed information for this record, this extracted record, you just go ahead and click this URL and it will show you the indexed information. And sometimes that, um, information will also include a link to an image. Okay, so let's go on to talking about community contributed records. If we can determine that a record in Family Tree was created by a community contributed IGI record, what does that tell us? Well, it actually tells us that the reliability varies widely depending on the contributor. Remember that family group sheet that we looked at? Some contributors were professional genealogists or had access to extensive records. Others were maybe beginning genealogists or they didn't have access to as many records. So it runs the gamut basically. If you've got a community contributed record, the best advice I could give is to verify the information because we just don't know about the quality. It could be excellent or it could have room for improvement. Now, for contributions before 1999, additional information may be available on the film of the patron submission. The reason 1999 is the cutoff is that after that point, submissions were only accepted digitally. So they stopped accepting paper submissions and so they stopped microfilming them. At least that's my understanding. So also, again, since it's an IGI record, temple work was almost certainly completed for this individual. And again, you'll see records sometimes in Family Tree that don't have temple work attached to them, but somewhere there will be a duplicate that has the temple work attached if it's a community contributed record. Okay, let's look at an example. This was actually really exciting for me to, 
to go through this little process and find out how useful the IGI could be. So I had entered the name of Mary Gunton, and not, not this one, I'd entered the name of Mary Gunton in Family Tree and I was ready to reserve her name for temple work. And I did a duplicate search and most of the duplicates that, or most of the possible duplicates that came up, I could tell they were, you know, Mary Gunton, pretty common name, but I could pretty much rule them out. But I could not rule out this one because it didn't have enough information. And so I thought, I've got to do, I just had a feeling I, that I ought to do a little digging on this. So there's some interesting things about this record that made me think that it probably came from the IGI. For one thing, the information was incomplete. So there was a birthplace, but there was no birth or christening year. Not only that, there's no such place as Cat Hearth in Cambridgeshire. So I, there, there's two big red flags right there. Another thing that I noticed as I looked over this record is that Mary was it. I mean, there was nothing else connected to her. No parents, no spouse, no children. So not only did we have a very incomplete birthplace, but we didn't have family relationships. So let's look at some of the clues also that led me to believe that this was probably an IGI record. One is that the PID starts with a 9. Now I need to be really careful on that. PIDs, Family Search does not assign PIDs in given categories. So in other words, they didn't say, oh, these are all IGI records, let's make them 9s. What happened was they assigned numbers sequentially to batches of records. So because of that, similar records will often have similar numbers. Does that make sense? So the family search, you can't say that a number means something, but you can say that a number was probably assigned to a certain batch of records, and therefore all those records would have um, numbers that start with 9. I hope that makes sense. And so I found many times that IGI records do start with 9s. So that was a clue right there. Also, remember we looked at that old family group record with the, you know, there's no such thing as standardizing places back then, so people just wrote whatever abbreviations for places and for months and so forth that they wanted to. And so you see here, Cambridge is not the full name. The standard now is Cambridgeshire, and England is also not spelled out. So you see that wasn't standardized. And then also the relationships were incomplete. And that is also typical of IGI records because at the time, back in the um, early days of the, of the church when they asked people to send in these records, people did the best they had and they didn't have complete information. So that is kind of a red flag indicating that it, that it could very well be an IGI record. So I went to the IGI to search for this Mary from Cat Heath to see if I could figure out what was going on. One clue about searching in the IGI, or one hint I should say, is that if you find somebody in Family Tree that you think probably came from the IGI, search for them using the exact information even if it's not standardized because it's not going to be standardized in the IGI. So you want to look for it using that either incorrect or non-standard information. So when I searched for that, she came up right at the top. So she really was from the IGI and it really did say Cat Hearth. So then I clicked her name to open the record and this is the very cool thing. For records that were submitted before 1999, there will very often be an IGI film number. So I went to that film number and actually this was a film that they did not allow to be circulated. So I had to go to where the film was held and I actually don't remember now, it was either BYU or um, Salt Lake, but one of the two had this film. And so I went there and looked it up 
And lo and behold, it was the, the submission that was used to do the temple work. And it had the name of the person who had submitted this record for Mary Gunton. And the person was her niece. And as it happened, I knew who the niece was and found her in Family Tree. So I was able to determine who this Mary Gunton was. And as it happened, she was a duplicate for the name that I had submitted. So doing this little bit of digging in the IGI enabled me to avoid a duplicate temple ordinance. So that's an example of how to use the IGI to check out um, community contributed information. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. So just in summary, we mentioned that the IGI is a collection of about 900 million names according to the wiki, but we now have reason to believe that that's probably not accurate, and I will correct that in either a later presentation or on the YouTube page or both. Also, the data in the IGI is now locked. For many years, it was growing and uh, entries were being added, but that is no longer the case. And the data also varies widely in quality. And the thing that I think most of us will find most helpful about the IGI is that it provides clues for family tree records. And if you're wondering where most, most of this information came from, it's from a book that I've mentioned before in my webinars, which I absolutely love. It's called Hearts Turn to the Fathers, and it's by these three brethren right here. And it actually appeared first in BYU Studies, and then it was compiled into a book. This basically traces the history of family history in the church from the Restoration and the appearance of Elijah clear down until, I believe, about 1999, if I remember correctly, so the, the very end of the last century. So if you want a really fascinating look at how genealogy has grown over the church, over the existence of the church and the miracles that have happened and also the struggles that the church has been faced with and has tried to solve. If you'd like a fascinating look at all those things, get this book. Also, I should mention that this book is available online. Uh, you can get it at Deseret Book, I believe, and probably other LDS booksellers, and there's, also, there's an electronic version of it. I think there's a Kindle and probably a couple others. But if you want to read it online for free, you can Google Hearts Turn to the Fathers BYU Studies, and you can find PDFs of the BYU Studies article. But frankly, they're kind of a pain to navigate. So it's the, the choice is if you want to save the money and you don't mind the pain to navigate, use them free online. But if you're like, okay, I don't even want to hassle with that. I'd rather pay the 10 bucks than go to an LDS bookseller and buy the book. So that concludes our webinar today. And thank you so much for being here. We do have a couple and Braden, so far. Do uh, we have any questions? The first one is, am I incorrect in thinking the IGI was only records of temple work completed? That is a great question. My understanding to that is yes, because that's where the information came from originally was temple records and extracted records that were given to the temple for temple work. There may be some exceptions to that, but I understand that, for instance, the ancestral file and the pedigree resource file, which didn't have temple work, are not part of the IGI. Those are kept in separate databases. So I believe that the records in the IGI, it's my understanding that they should all have temple work done. Sometimes it didn't all get done. Sometimes you'll find one that has you know, baptism and uh, confirmation initiatory, but not an endowment. But um, but at least some of the temple work should right, have been thank done. Thank you. And our next thank one you for is, that question. how can you tell if a submission to the IGI was extracted or a community contributed record? Oh my goodness, that is such a good question. And I would say there's two hints to that. 
normally the extracted records will have an, that little notification that we saw in the sources section and it will say that this was create this re person was created from an extracted IGI record I have seen extracted records once in a while that didn't have that notice but most of them do I would say like 99% of them do other clues though in case you don't see that little notice on an extracted record Extracted records were normally baptisms, infant baptisms, or marriages. Once in a while burials, but usually only if it proved that a child died before eight. So the large majority of extracted records were infant baptisms or marriages. Well, how does that show up on a record? If it's an infant baptism, you will see somebody in family tree who has a name and a christening date and location and they will have parents but the parents will not have any information because they were just extracted as part of the baptism record and there weren't you know birth dates for the parents or there weren't uh, birth places for the parents they basically the parents were extracted on an infant baptism to help identify the child so if you see a record that looks like that, that has a christening date and location and just has parents with no identifying information for the parents and no siblings, no um, spouses or anything, then that's a really strong indication that that record came from an infant baptism, an extracted record of an infant baptism. Similarly for marriages, if you see a record for a couple and there is a marriage date, but there is no um, no parents for the person or there might be a father for English extracted marriages there might just be a father but he has no information such as a birth um, birth information birth dates so forth but and you'll just um, he'll just be attached to the couple that got married but there won't be any other identifying information beyond his name so if you see a record like that, and also no kids, because of course at the time they got married, the kids wouldn't have been on the extracted marriage record. So if you see a record like that, that's a pretty good indication that it was an extracted marriage record. For community contributed, honestly, the biggest clue for me is the PIDs. Most of the time for community contributed back in the days of the IGI, they'll start with a nine, or they'll start with an M as in Mary. So when I see those, and then also when I see non-standard information, like that Cat Hearth um, Cambridge ing that wasn't that didn't follow um, today's Family Search standards, and also lack of relationships and just kind of incomplete information, those are clues to me that those probably were um, IGI records. You can confirm that actually then by going back to the IGI and searching with that information and if you find them in the IGI then that proves that that is where they came from. Oh, and I just realized one thing to mention about that is that in the IGI, up if you look up in the URL, you will notice something that looks like a PID, a person ID, and that's that um, seven digit number in family tree that identifies every record uniquely so it might be MQZ5-243 or whatever. So you'll see that IGI records have IDs. Well, when those records were brought from the IGI over to family tree, they kept those PIDs. So if you see that an IGI record has the same ID as a family tree record, you absolutely know that that IGI record was the source. Now that being said, merging can change those records. For instance, if you merged an IGI record with a non-IGI record, but the non-IGI record is the surviving one, then it will not have the same matching number as the IGI record even though it really came from even though the you know the piece of the merged record actually came from there does that make sense I hope so <laughs> so thank you I hope that answers the question but please ask a follow-up question if it doesn't I believe that is everything Braden anything um, else so thank you very much Catherine and before everybody leaves today we'd like to just ask you to take a minute to give us some feedback we have a little bit a little box down at the bottom for you to enter in some feedback 
um, and to write in if you'd like to hear a specific topic in the future. It's always really helpful. Also, be sure to follow us on our social media sites and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you get notifications when um, new videos are uploaded and you can stay up to date on what's going on here at the BYU Family History Library. Um, and again, our next webinar is next Friday, the 26th at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and we hope to see you then. Thank you for joining us today and hope everyone has a great weekend.